The following program is sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. About money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your host, Mike Adams, is a registered investment advisor and works with investment portfolios exceeding over $100,000 in net worth and has a proven track record of managing long-term investments surpassing the markets in the long term. The information shared on the following program is for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's Mike. It's Friday afternoon, and we're going to be talking about money. We're going to be talking and taking you back to 1815 later in the program for something which might be of interest and might have an impact on what you're thinking of. It might explode, right? Anyway, we'll come to that later on. My guest today has a very interesting story and something that really is close to me. We'll be talking about that later on. But I want to start with the news that came out this week that Elizabeth Warren, Senator Elizabeth Warren, is targeting annuities. It's a big concern for her. It was a big concern because of the way that annuities are handled. She, went, she sent letters to 15 of the largest annuity providers asking about the perks they provide to the financial advisors who sell the annuities. Because those financial advisors, if you sell enough, you get a huge, in some cases, you get a huge ring, a ring that is similar to and at the size of the same ring that the Super Bowl champions get, the same kind of ring that World Series champions get, those players. If you sell enough annuities, there are prizes. If you sell enough annuities to do a cruise or to go on trips to Europe, to go to, to parties and expense paid trips. And she's raising the question, isn't it a conflict of interest? Are they really making choices in the best interest of the clients? Or is it to gain the ring or the cruise or the party or the many other things? kinds of things that they get rewarded with when they sell annuities. Because it's you, the person that's buying the annuities, that's really paying that. Not only are you paying high fees, not only are you getting a high surrender charge, not only are you getting reduced performance, but you're also paying for all those perks. Helen Olin wrote a book called Pound Foolish, Exposing the Dark Side of the Finance Industry. And she mentions two things about annuities. There's two things that you can count on. First, they're increasingly sold to baby boomers who are running out of, who are worried about running out of money. And secondly, they're so complicated, they're so difficult to understand, there's so many financial penalties that many financial experts don't like them. Even Susie Orman. Susie Orman is not one of my favorite people. Susie Orman is one of those people who I don't think gives great advice, but she's as well known as anybody, second best known only to Jim Cramer in the finance world. But even Susie Orman, and I don't agree with what she says, but I agree on this point, she doesn't like annuities. And she says, as does Helen say, annuities are sold for one reason and only one reason, and that's to make money for financial advisors. Rarely is it in the best interest of clients to, to buy an annuity. Now, I, I take it back. It's not everyone who's excluded. There are some people who do qualify and should have an annuity. Those people, I know one person, for example, that I recommended that they get an annuity. And I don't sell annuities. We don't we don't market annuities at Adams Financial Concepts. That's something that we will recommend another person to do. But in this case, this is a person that had a, a chunk of money come their way and they went right through it within a year. For them, it makes sense to do an annuity because it locks up the money and the money is distributed for the rest of their life. For somebody like that, it really makes sense. But rarely, in most cases, does it make sense. Not only that, they are things that 
financial advisors sell. There was, there was a Harvard professor, Cindy Muhohayton, if I pronounce his, his name right. He devised some sample portfolios, and he hired a bunch of actors to go visit financial advisors. And he asked them to meet with the financial advisors and see what kind of advice these actors got. Now, they were portfolios of stocks and bonds and mutual funds and whatever, but he wanted to send them to financial advisors and see what kind of advice they got. <clears throat> and in each one of those cases, the financial advisor refused to correct client investment biases. So a client might think that they they had a portfolio that was built conservatively. It wasn't built conservatively. They might have a bias toward a certain aspect. In each case, the financial advisor refused to really correct the investment advice investment advice or investment bias the client had refused to say this is the way it should be they reinforced the bias and they were willing to make the client worse off by changing the portfolio they made made a huge number of changes to most portfolios they really changed the portfolio complex and rebuilt the portfolios but the most worrisome thing of all said the professor is the financial advisors were so personable that they built the relationship and 70% of these actors who really didn't own the, the portfolios and knew that they were getting bad advice, 70% were willing to return even knowing that they were worse off than what they went with. Annuities are like that. They're hard to sell. Financial advisors are highly rewarded. Some financial advisors and insurance agents earn as much as 14% of the annuity face value. Rates of 8 to 10% are fairly typical. Equitrust had a market 12 bonus index that paid the financial advisor 9% the first year. And Alliance Master Dex 5 paid 7% the first year and 4% the second year. That's a lot to pay to the financial advisor. That is not something the insurance company is paying. That's something the purchaser of the annuity is paying. And when you look at the performance of the annuity, they're even more complicated. Very often, financial advisors will sell inflation protection, a shorter surrender period, guaranteed income if the market falls. Prudential, for example, has an average income guarantee. You can get an annuity, but you pay, pay extra for it. It's going to guarantee the income, but you pay 2.5%, 2.51% for that guarantee. <clears throat> and 96% of annuities are sold with those extra add-ons. means this, if the market is up five, is, if the market is up 7% and you have a variable annuity, your annuity only increases by 3.5%. If the market is up 5%, you get a 1.5% return. Now, with what's happened with annuities, annuities are not only allowed to be purchased by individuals. Now, they're approved to go into 401ks as well. So, not only are you getting the protection in 401ks, of tax deferred, but you get this extra shelter of the annuity and the extra cost of an annuity. <clears throat> Guy Mazwaski, an analyst for Merrill Lynch, was interviewed by the New York Times, and he was reporting and he was covering Morgan Stanley, Smith Barney, and he said that the, if annuities were dropped, it would cost Morgan Stanley, $300 million in revenues. If, if their financial advisors have to do everything in the best interest of their clients, it will cost $300 million in revenues. You know, think about, think about it. A number of these companies are saying, if we go to a fiduciary standard where everyone has to make, where every financial advisor has to make decisions in the best interest of the clients, that 
they are going to tr- not be able to service their small clients. You know, to me, it seems like a strange response. You know, if a, a financial advisor is forced to take the time to find out what is in the client's best interest and act on it, the industry doesn't think they have a viable model. That doesn't sound right. Doesn't sound right. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. But when you go and are invited to a lot of these seminars, they are not a free lunch. <clears throat> the SEC and FINRA say that over half of the flyers that are out there promoting the free seminar, the free annuity seminar, are actually misleading. They're marketed as low risk. That's misleading. They're based on creating fear. And 9% of the attendees who will go to these free lunches believing they're getting a low risk, believing they're getting market participation, they're going to do as well as the stock market. 9%, that's one out of every 10, will actually buy the annuity. We're coming up to a commercial, don't go away. I want to return to this subject, finish this up. You want to hear what my guest has to say? And you want to hear about Mount Tambura. That's coming up later in the program. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this commercial. About Money. We'll resume in a moment with Mike Adams on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Lots of people manage investment portfolios. Just a few can manage a successful portfolio and provide exceedingly great service to their clients. Here's Mike Adams from Adams Financial Concepts. We believe the price you pay should be based on the performance of your portfolio and the quality of service you receive. You know, Mike, it seems that a lot of companies subscribe to the one-size-fits-all mentality of investing. Does one size really fit all? Not with us. Every portfolio that we manage is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. We place our clients' interests first in all portfolio decisions. If you're looking for a home for your seven-figure-plus investment portfolio, call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts, specializing in creating and maintaining wealth for over 20 years. 206-903-1019. That's 206-903-1019. Or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So I've been talking about annuities. Annuities, which many consider to be one of the worst investments that people can make. But they're the target audience for annuities are seniors and baby boomers. They are, they're advertised as being low risk. They're advertised as being guaranteed. They're advertised as a way to, to assure that you're going to receive a certain amount of income in the long run, or you're going to receive a death benefit. The pattern for selling these is always the same or seems to always be the same. They use fear. You know, that's, that's something they say, make them sweat a little. They pose a problem at the same time so that the annuity is always the solution. But they never use the word annuity. They press the hot button. Will your retirement survive an economic meltdown? Will your retirement survive a 2008, 2009? For those who are facing new retirement, There's one slide after another, after another, always asking the same kind of question. Will you be able to survive? Will you be able to have the income you need? Health care care costs are rising. Social security is uncertain. Maybe taxed up to 85%. They're going to take 85% of your social security maybe. They'll find people that have said that, and then they'll quote it. They'll talk one thing after another to create a fear. There's nothing to fear, however, if you plan for it. And that's the sales pitch for an annuity. 
<clears throat> by going through this whole process, they will put some people into annuities that have no right to be there, and they'll say that the money is guaranteed. Insurance companies don't go broke. Never go broke. I heard that phrase once in the advertisement for an annuity. But the reality is that they do. Executive Life, the largest insurance company and annuity issuer in California, did go broke in 1991. The state took it over. First Capital Life died because they were, were buying junk bonds. Mutual Benefit Life. A huge shock. It was a triple A. All these were triple A rated companies. Mutual Benefit Life was a huge company and a huge shock, huge shock to the market and to the insurance industry. It was conservative. It was blue chip. It was solid, triple A plus rated or A plus rated. Unbelievable when they filed for bankruptcy. And the money is paid out because there is a parent is a guarantee. The annuity companies, the insurance companies pay into a fund which will pay off the insurance companies. And if you have one or two that fail, the payments come out on time. But in an extreme hardship, when you have some like mutual benefit life, those payments could have been stretched out instead of paying off over 10 years as they were supposed to, they could have been stretched out over 30 or 40 years. The payments, instead of being at the rate that was forecast, could be at a, a significantly lower amount until you got paid in full. In fact, Mutual Benefit Life was acquired by another insurance company. <clears throat> Baldwin United, 1987, same thing, acquired by MetLife, but those payments were delayed for four years. So people that depended upon that income had to wait and went without that income for four years. And then it was only the minimum payment, the lowest interest rate. Today, the lowest interest rate would be, what, a quarter of a percent? That's what you receive? It's not FDIC insured. It's not government insured. It's the insurance industry. I believe that these annuities are like chocolate-covered hand grenades. They sound so good. They sound like they're going to solve the, the issue of what to do if we have another meltdown in the economy. They don't. For certain people, they're the right thing to do. But for an investment, for many people that are going to come up to retirement or be in retirement, or for their 401k, I don't think that it really works. That's my comment on annuities. Part of this program is to introduce you to the listener so that you can be aware of what's going on in the industry, be aware of what's going on in the economy. And I have a very interesting guest today. Comes out of the gaming industry and has a company that does games. But I'm going to let him tell you about it. My guest today is Mike Selinker of... Of Lone, Lone Shark, Game. Shark yeah. Games. So, Mike, welcome to the program. Mike. Thanks, Mike. So why don't we start with your background? Sure. Um, I'm a game designer by trade. I mean, I have a company president hat. I'm a CEO, you know. But fundamentally, the company is built around stuff that myself and my designer friends come up with. Um, it's all very creative. Uh, I used to be an employee of Hasbro. I was the one of the creative directors there. For about eight years or so, uh, one of their lead designers. And that was a fine place to be. It was great. There's a company here in Seattle called Wizards of the Coast that's an arm of Hasbro that I worked for. And then eventually in 2003, I left Hasbro to found this company, Lone Shark Games. It was, you know, just a startup. Um, we're still a startup. It's not 2003 anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great time to be in the game industry it's uh we've we've had an incredible amount of success stories that have made people very excited about what we do and um and the world is radically changing around us and it's really fun to be a part of that change so when you say a a game company a, i think there's electronic games yep. and there's board games so yep. 
Loan Shark Games. We do both. Um, we uh, we specialize more in, in board games and card games and what a lot of people call traditional games. Not because we don't like electronic games. We play them all the time. But they're, um, they're very big and uh, difficult to make. And so, and there's a pretty high failure rate of, of video games. And um, whereas uh, the, the tabletop game environment, the board games as such, uh, is going through a huge renaissance, there's no uh, guarantee of success, but we have a pretty consistent ability to pay all of our personnel and, um, and make sure that uh, people get products that they like from us. And uh, it just goes very, it just, it's a great business to be in. You know, I grew up playing cards and yeah. playing board games. And so it's dear to my heart. And of course, when we talked before, we talked about one of the games, which I truly, truly love called Acquire. Yeah. One of the greatest games of all time. Uh, we talked that uh, basically we have the same copy of it, uh, that uh, there's a, uh, it was originally released in 1962 by the company 3M, which most people associate with Post-it notes and and uh, and you know uh, plastic products and things like that, tape, right? But they actually made games back in the '60s, and one of the games they made was this classic game, Acquire, which was about building hotels. And uh, both you and I just, you know, it's one of the greatest games we've ever played. I play it all the time. You know, we I went through grad school, and there were two things that you you played. You either played bridge or you. Yeah. You played Acquire. Right. And Acquire was uh, better because Bridge is a festival of cheating. Right? <laughs> Basically, everybody, you know, giving each other winks and hand nudges under the table and things like that, right? Whereas Acquire is that's a real game. It's a real game. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, it's, it's, it's rare to find somebody who, uh, who has uh, one of those copies. Those things are really hard to come by, but it's one of my most treasured possessions as a game designer. Well, and you wrote a book, right? Yeah. Uh, I wrote I wrote a book uh, about I've written written a bunch of books but um, the I think the book you're talking about is the guide to board game design and uh, the um, you know it's it's important to understand that that you don't have to be a historian of games you don't have to um, you know uh, check anything off your list to be a game player or anything like that but we do spend a lot of time trying to like educate people about the history of games and and things like that. And uh, so games like Acquire show up as, as touchstones for young game designers, for, for people who want to be presidents of companies in the game industry and things like that. And when they don't know them, you know, what it says is they're not necessarily a well-rounded game player, so they might make really poor decisions about what kind of games to make. Whereas if you immerse yourself, I, I encourage everybody who works with us to immerse themselves in games and... Uh, just, I mean, this is not, you know, I don't think it's necessary for everybody to be in an industry to be an obsessed, you know, uh, consumer of their own products. I mean, I, I assume that there are um, non-smokers who work for R.J. Reynolds, right? Right. But, but in our industry, it helps to be really, really smart about these things. So you also wrote a book that the top 100 games of all time. Well, I... I I was part of that book. Yeah, I, I didn't write the whole thing. Uh, um, but yes, uh, there were lots of lots of really great game designers who said, you know, um, uh, each of them picked games that they wanted to talk about. You know, they, we each wrote essays about those games. I uh, I focused on a game that that uh, will, you know, it, it's funny to talk about like like money and finance and stuff like this in this environment because, you know, games are supposed to be all light and, and, and such. But, but, you know, this is a game, it's a game called Bonanza and it's a game about bean farming. And, uh, and people are just like, why would you pick a game about bean farming? I mean, you can make a game about anything. I'm like, yeah, but these guys made a game about bean farming, <laughs> right? Like that, that's a huge gamble, right? That's a, like if your game about bean farming isn't any good, then no one's going to pick it up. But instead, they were like, this is, this is what this game is about, right? And I thought that that was one of the great market assessments of all time in the game industry, right? Is to just go, okay, we know people will want to play this game when they get it. So let's reserve a subject that uh, they, would, they might steer away from, right? <laughs> For something that's this good. I really like that approach. So 
we're going to come back and talk more about the games, the gaming industry, and Kickstarter. We're going to come and talk about that. So don't go away. We're coming to a commercial. We'll be right back after this commercial. More about money coming up with Mike Adams on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to AdamsFinancialConcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's AdamsFinancialConcepts.com can even listen to now we return to about money there's more information waiting for you at adamsfinancialconcepts.com here again is your host mike adams so i'm here with mike selinker of lone star games lone shark games um we've been talking about the best 100 games, but I want to shift and talk about some of the games that you've developed sure, and sure. brought out. I and mean, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. They're board games or card games. Yeah. Um, I've, I've had the great fortune to work on a bunch of game lines that everybody grew up with. Uh, I created a Risk game called Risk Godstorm, which I was really happy to make. Um, I worked on uh, Axis and Allies, which is a classic World War II game. Um, I've, uh, I've, I helped out with an edition of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, you know, all sorts of things like that. Uh, and there's, there's real value to, I, I've done, done things for, for Disney and for Marvel and, and Star Wars and, and all that stuff. And it's great. Um, in the last few years, we've shied away from most of those, uh, with the exception of a major project we did for Disney. Most of the stuff we've done is our own creations brand new stuff that we really wanted to do uh, and and it came from a realization that that those games are going to be around uh, for a long time and they're going to be associated with the game itself not the people who worked on them and we wanted to blaze a couple of trails so um, we decided to make essentially our own our own projects and those have gone very very well for us we've uh, we did um, an interactive puzzle book called uh, The Maze of Games, which was a, uh, a book where all the pages are in the wrong order and you have to solve the puzzles to put them in the right order. Um, we did another game called The Pathfinder Adventure Card Game, which was a kind of a groundbreaking um, way to play a card game that can last not just for a couple hours, but an entire year uh, where people you know, hold on to their card deck and, and it improves over time and all that. Um, We've just uh, we, we've made some more traditional games like um, a game called Lords of Vegas, which was in some some way inspired by that the game Acquire, you know, uh, mm -hmm. trying to make a, a financial simulation game, but at the same time make it about something really fun like the the constant uh, chaos that is Las Vegas and the casino business. Um, uh, so we've done a lot of those and. Uh, We've, we've just announced a new game. Uh, it's called Apocrypha. It's a, a game about, uh, it's a sort of a horror-themed kind of game that, that we just brought out, or I mean just announced that we're doing uh, and started on Kickstarter this past month. And uh, so that's gone really well for us too. So we, we, we've sort of run a, a big gamut of, of whatever, basically whatever we wanted to make, and it's gone reasonably great. It's pretty amazing to see the the revival in board games. Yeah, it's been just the best time. I mean, it was it was hard in the you know in the '90s. You would say, "Oh, I'm a I'm a game designer," and the immediately immediate presumption was that you were a video game designer, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with those. We love those. Um, but we'd have to say, "No, no, no. Uh, actually, I make games that people play around a table," and they're like, "Why would anyone do that?" Right. Um, that's that's something kids do. Right. That's not something that adults do. And now uh, now, like I have a, a 25 year old uh, developer on my team 
and she has not known a world where board games were not popular, right? Because they're they're everywhere now. Like you play, you know, with the rise of games like Cranium and uh, and uh, the show Tabletop and, and stuff like that. They're they're everywhere, um, and they're a, a very popular form of entertainment. I looked the other day at the Kickstarter site and the top six projects on Kickstarter, the, the hot projects, whatever that word means, um, all of them were tabletop games. It's, you know, one thing that tabletop games do that video games don't do is you relate to the people around the yeah, table. Yeah. And so, you know, you're a, their opponents, they may be partners, yeah. but you really relate. And it's, you know, we've been playing those games in my family now in third generation. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, the interaction style hasn't changed. The games themselves have changed quite a bit. But just the ability to say from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. tonight, we're all just going to relate to each other. Yeah. That's fantastic. It is fantastic. And and there's not a lot of other types of activity. Like, I I think of it a lot like being, you know, like uh, if a chef came over and said, we're going to uh, display for you the greatest feast for the next three hours. And everybody would come to the table and play that, or, you know, and, and, and participate in that, right? Well, it's like that. I mean, you open up a box, and there's something that has been very carefully prepared for you. And you, as a group, come together and enjoy the fruits of it. I think that is a thing that doesn't really exist in most other contexts. No. You know, if you go to a movie, you're sitting there yeah, watching yeah. it. You're all facing TV, the same direction. S- facing the same way. It's, yeah. you know, over a family meal, you have family time, but a game is, is real family time. But I want to shift it and talk. You mentioned Kickstarter. Yes. And I want to talk about Kickstarter. I am thrilled to talk about that Because subject. most people, I don't think, understand what Kickstarter is and and how it functions. So I, don't, I, I don't think there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who are, on Kickstarter every day who do not understand what Kickstarter is or how it functions. So tell us about Kick. First, tell us about your experience of Kickstarter. Sure. And then tell us about Kickstarter. Sure. Um, Kickstarter uh, for us sort of came into awareness uh, around 2012 and uh, maybe late 2011 when uh, a few games were funded on it that became very large. Uh, one of them is called Cards Against Humanity, which is a uh, sort of foul-mouthed uh, uh, entertainment game. And it funded on Kickstarter. They raised uh, about $7,000, which was an unheard of amount of money, $7,000. And uh, so, you know, people were like, wow, you could, you could actually get a little bit of money in advance to make your game. That sounded great, right? And so we thought, okay, we can do that. That would be something that would be pretty great for us to try. Um, so basically the way the site has been for us is it's a – a method to reach a very uh, friendly group of people, a, very, a, a group of people that is excited about what we do, and have them give us patronage. Um, so basically, they underwrite a project for us that they want in a year or so, and then we make it, and then we ship it to them. It's not, uh, it's not an investment in any meaningful way. Right. I mean, it's not like you participate in the profits or anything like that. It is that you get a product that you would normally be able to get in a store uh, or maybe not. But at the very least, the theory is that you'd be able to get it in a store. But it wouldn't exist if enough people didn't put money into it so that the creators could live and print that object and, and illustrate that object or whatever it is that the thing is. Um, So it's changed quite a bit since 2012 because now um, uh, we have projects that are millions of dollars raised on Kickstarter, and some of them are good and some of them are bad. Um, I'm in the sort of high end of of my particular um, industry in terms of, like, we we can generally count on a a six-figure sum if we're if we're putting something out there that's really great right and that's enough that's that's all you need to get going you know i looked up the numbers on kickstarter sure. and in 2010 they raised 27 million to fund 3910 projects huh. 2010 not long after they were they started in 2011 99 
million, yeah. up from 27 the year before, and funded 11,836 projects. In 2013, the last numbers I was able to get, it was up to 480 million yeah. on 19,911 projects. Yeah. It's, and that was Kickstarter. That doesn't include crowdfunding and Indiegogo no. and, and some no. of the others that are doing similar kinds of things. It's, and, and when you think about it from Kickstarter's point of view, um, they make 5%. Basically, that's what they do. They have a website, and they, they make 5% of whatever happens on that website. And they create some tools that are helpful to the creator. Um, the, the back end is very sophisticated and, and such. But fundamentally, they don't create anything. Right? They create a, a, an environment upon which other things can be created. And that has been magnificent. It is the single greatest help to a, a group of creative people that has ever happened in the United States. And it's not just in the gaming industry. No, it's everything. Yeah. The New York Times called it the People's um, NEA. Yeah. National Endowment. Sure. National Endowment for the Arts. Because a lot of arts projects yeah. are raising money through Kickstarter. Dance, um, fashion, uh, electronics, um, uh, just puzzles, any kind of thing that somebody can create that is truly a creative art can be done on that site. They don't, they don't allow certain things. They don't allow you to develop drugs. Right, because those yeah. really should be licensed by the FDA. Um, they don't allow you to make cars because I'm not going to ride in anybody's first car, right? <laughs> I mean, like <laughs> those, that's not that doesn't sound very safe, right? <laughs> right. But I will take a chance on somebody's first book. That's not going to hurt me at all. And first game, yeah, and first game, right? Um, so we've helped mentor a lot of people on Kickstarter. Uh, we have a thing called the Loan Shark Games Kickstarter Fund, which has funded. I'm sorry participated in the funding of 150 projects. Uh, we reserve money every year. It's, it's not charitable. We don't claim that this is like, you know, some sort of uh, gift that, that we're helping people out with. We're actually hoping that they take these, these contributions and this advertisement and stuff that we're doing for them and gaining more ability to, to make the greatest things. Fantastic. Thanks for being on the program. Thanks for Absolutely. Lone Shark Games. And for telling us about Kickstarter. Coming up after the commercial, you'll be hearing about a volcano and how it applies to investments. Don't go away. Be right back. I'm not going. We're back with more about. Stay tuned. About Money returns in a moment with your host, Mike Adams, here on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Just a few can manage a successful portfolio and provide exceedingly great service to their clients. Here's Mike Adams from Adams Financial Concepts. We believe the price you pay should be based on the performance of your portfolio and the quality of service you receive. You know, Mike, it seems that a lot of companies subscribe to the one-size-fits-all mentality of investing. Does one size really fit all? Not with us. Every portfolio that we manage is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. We place our client's interests first in all portfolio decisions. If you're looking for a home for your seven-figure-plus investment portfolio, call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts, specializing in creating and maintaining wealth for over 20 years. 206-903-1019. That's 206-903-1019. Or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Com. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So this week we've had the volcano in Chile, Cabuco, that has exploded three times at least. And it got me to thinking, got me to reading an Economist article about the year 1850, 1815. 1815 is a year, if you look back in history, was the time of Waterloo, you know, the end of Napoleon in France. 1815, the, the history books record the final decision of the Congress of Vienna, which regrew the borders of Europe. 
the idea was to rebalance the countries and, and even distribution of power. 1815 was the birth of Otto von Bismarck. Huge events, but very few talk about what was probably the biggest event of that entire year. And that was Mount Tambora, a volcano in the, on the Indonesian island of Sumbawa. It blew. It not only blew, but it blew in a spectacular fashion. It blew molten rock 25 miles into the air. Can you imagine? You see the pictures on TV of the volcanoes going and the molten rock is running over the edges of the, the volcano, blowing up, bubbling out. Can you imagine a stream of molten rock going up 25 miles into the air? That's how it blew. It was the most powerful eruption we've had in over 500 years. And the ash spread across hundreds of thousands of miles. It reached the eastern coast of the United States. Think about Mount St. Helens. It blew up here 25, 30 years ago, maybe over 30 years ago. The ash spread around the state of Washington, but it didn't reach much of California. It didn't reach past the Rocky Mountains. Mount Tambora blew ash that spread to the eastern part of the U.S. Not only did it spread the ash, it spread dust and it spread rock and ash all over that area. And it set off multiple tsunamis, not one, not two, but six or eight tsunamis. <clears throat> it killed, or there was a loss of 60 to 120,000 people that died. And it spent, sent not only the molten rock into the atmosphere, but it sent sulfur. The effects were that it reached as far as the eastern part of the U.S. Think of where Indonesia is in Southeast Asia. It reached all the way into the eastern part of the U.S. and into Britain. The weather cooled down, and not only that, the ash so covered things up. The clothes on the, the clotheslines in those days, 1850, you didn't have washing machines and dryers. You did, did the washing, you hung it on a clothesline. The clothes froze on the, wash, on the lines. That was in New England, New Hampshire, Maine. Glaciers increased in size. They came charging down the Alps. Grain, because it affected the weather so much, grain in Britain was in short supply. In Britain, they had a corn law. They restricted the amount of production of corn and of grain called the corn laws because it was very similar to the subsidies when we, we were paying dairy farmers not to milk their cows. They were paying not to produce grain. But it caused such a shortage that they reduced and did away with the corn laws for a year. It was so much ash in the atmosphere that it continued through the year 1816. Average temperatures were lower by four degrees on, in the U.S. and in Europe, and probably Asia, due to the ash. 1816 was a wet year. The crops were bad. All due, or mostly due, to that one explosion. Nothing like it since. Maybe nothing like that in our lifetime. But think of the impact we had on Mount St. Helens and think of what the impact was of a Mount Tambora. You know, you can't foresee something like that happening. Nobody can predict when that will happen again, if it will ever happen again. It's a true black sheep event. We talked about 2008, 2009 as being a black sheep event, but you could see in retrospect, at least, we could see the buildup in the credit markets. We could see the buildup leading to that. With a volcano, we couldn't see that. And the impact of that for investments will probably be very similar to 2008-2009. Now, I was at a conference in 2010. 
which I want to bring all this together. I was in a conference in 2010 and very, very close to the 2008, 2009, there were still concerns. There were still worries. People were concerned. They'd seen their investment portfolios drop down. They'd seen some terrible things happen. Retirees weren't able to retire on time, or if they were retired, they were seeing their, their incomes reduced. Parents were changing the college options for their children because the college funds weren't there. All those things happened over 2008, 2009. And I went to one session where there were people that were talking about how to assure your portfolio and your income so that if we have another 2008, 2009, something we can't see, a black sheep event, that your income is going to be essentially guaranteed. I went to that. But you know, the cost of that was essentially 6% per year of your portfolio. Think about that. If the stock market is up 10% on the average, and it has been up 10% from 1982 to 2000, just a little over 10% during that period of time, and I believe that we may be in a period of time where we're seeing even a, an increase over that. But if your portfolio is up just 10%, if you're giving up 6% to prevent a 2008-2009, you're effectively reducing your return to 4%. That's a significant impact. After a couple of years, you're going to have a much worse impact than if you'd kept the 10% and went through a 2008-2009. But people were actually thinking about that. There was a fear. There was a fear of what had happened, a fear that it was going to happen again. And you had some people that were willing to give up 6% return per year on their portfolios. And if the portfolios weren't up 6%, you had a negative return on the portfolio. That's, that was the kind of fear. It's a black sheep event, something completely unpredictable. When you think of a Mount Tabura blowing up, having that kind of black sheep event, something that you can't foresee, is it worth per taking a 6% hit on your portfolio to prevent something that we may never see in our lifetime. I believe that we're coming to times when we're going to see an end to the bull market. I believe that's going to be a significant ways away, but it will come to an end. We know it will almost for sure come to an end. It always has. Can't. Chances are, well, not in the near term, but in the longer term. Why give up 6% today for what might happen 10 or 15 years from now? Mount Taburas happen, but they don't happen and they aren't predictable. Black sheep events are not predictable. When you begin to worry about what happened yesterday instead of looking forward as to what is going on, you begin to give up your right to a real portfolio return. That wraps it up for today. Join me next week. We got more to talk about. Next week, I think I'll probably talk about another news article that came out that said that 25% of people, even those who are not poor, are dying poor. That's next week. Join me then. You've been listening to About Money with Mike Adams, a registered investment advisor. If you'd like more information about what you heard today or about Mike's investment philosophy and strategy, or if you want Mike to evaluate your own portfolio, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. The information shared on the preceding program was for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. Join us again next Friday afternoon at 3 for more About Money with Mike Adams here on Money Radio 1300 KKOL. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com.
The following program is sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts.